the penitent heart the best New Year's gift. Luke 13, verse 3, Except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. When we consider how heinous and aggravating our offenses are, in the sight of a just and holy God, that they bring down his wrath upon our heads and occasion us to live under his indignation, how ought we by this to be deterred from evil, or at least engaged to study to repent of it, and not commit the same again? But man is so thoughtless of an eternal state and has a little consideration of the welfare of his immortal soul that he can sin without any thought that he must give an account of his actions at the day of judgment. Or if he at times has any reflections on his behavior, they do not drive him to true repentance. He may for a short time refrain from falling into some gross sins, which he had lately committed, but then when the temptation comes again with power. He is carried away with the lust, and so he goes on promising and resolving, and in breaking both his resolutions and his promises as fast almost as he had made them. This is highly offensive to God. It is mocking of him. Brethren, when grace has given us to repent truly, we shall turn wholly to God, and let me beseech you to repent of your sins, for the time is hastening, when you will have neither time nor call to repent. There is none in the grave where we are going. But do not be afraid, for God often receives the greatest sinner to mercy through the merits of Christ Jesus. This magnifies the riches of his free grace, and should be an encouragement for you who are great notorious sinners to repent. For he shall have mercy upon you, if you through Christ return to him. Paul was an eminent instance of this. He speaks of himself as the chief of sinners, and he declares how God showed mercy to him. Christ loves to show mercy to sinners, and if you repent, he will have mercy upon you. But as no word is more mistaken than that of repentance, I shall first show you what the nature of repentance is. Number two, consider the several parts and causes of repentance. Number three, I shall give you some reasons why repentance is necessary to salvation. And four, exhort all of you high and low, rich and poor, one with another to endeavor after repentance. Number one, repentance, my brethren, in the first place, as to its nature, is a carnal and corrupt disposition of men being changed into a renewed and sanctified disposition. A man that is truly repented is truly regenerated. It is a different word for one and the same thing. The motley mixture of the beast and devil is gone. There is, as it were, a new creation wrought in your hearts. If your repentance is true, you are renewed throughout, both in soul and body. Your understandings are enlightened with the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. And your wills, which are stubborn, obstinate, and hated all good, are obedient and conformable to the will of God. Indeed, our deists tell us that man now has a free will to do good, to love God, and to repent when he will. But indeed, there is no free will in any of you but to sin. Nay, your free will leads you so far that you would, if possible, pull God from his throne. This may perhaps offend the Pharisees, but it is the truth in Christ which I speak. I lie not. Every man by his own natural will hates God. But when he is turned to the Lord by evangelical repentance, then his will is changed. Then your consciences, now hardened and benumbed, shall be quickened and awakened. Then your hard heart shall be melted, and your unruly affection shall be crucified. Thus by that repentance the whole soul will be changed. You will have new inclinations, new desires, and new habits. You may see how vile we are by nature that it requires so great a change to be made upon us, to recover us from this state of sin, and therefore the consideration of our dreadful state should make us earnest with God to change our condition. And that change, true repentance implies... Therefore, my brethren, consider how hateful your ways are to God. While you continue in sin, how abominable you are to him, 
while you run into evil. You cannot be said to be Christians while you are hating Christ and his people. True repentance will entirely change you. The bias of your souls will be changed. Then you will delight in God, in Christ, in his law, and in his people. You will then believe that there is such a thing as inward feeling, though now you may esteem it madness and enthusiasm. You will not then be ashamed of becoming fools for Christ's sake. You will not regard being scoffed at. It is not then they're pointing after you and crying, here comes another troop of his followers. Will dismay you. No, your soul will abhor such proceedings. The way of Christ and his people will be your whole delight. It is the nature of such repentance to make a change. And the greatest changes can be made here in the soul. So you see what repentance implies in its own nature. It denotes an abhorrence of all evil and a forsaking of it. I shall now proceed secondly to show you the parts of it and the causes concurring thereto. The parts are sorrow, hatred, and an entire forsaken of sin. Our sorrow and grief for sin must not spring merely from a fear of wrath. For if we have no other ground but that it proceeds from self-love, and not from any love to God, and if love to God is not the chief motive of your repentance, your repentance is in vain and not to be esteemed true. Many in our days think they're crying, God forgive me, or Lord have mercy upon me, or I am sorry for it, is repentance, and that God will esteem it as such. But indeed they are mistaken. It is not to draw near to God with our lips while our hearts are far from him which he regards. Repentance does not come by fits and starts. No, it is one continued act of our lives. For as we daily commit sin, so we need a daily repentance before God to obtain forgiveness for those sins we commit. It is not your confessing yourselves to be sinners. It is not knowing your condition to be sad and deplorable so long as you continue in your sins. Your care and endeavor should be to get the heart thoroughly affected with it, that you may feel yourselves to be lost and undone creatures, for Christ came to save such as are lost. And if you are enabled to groan under the weighted burden of your sins, then Christ will ease you and give you rest. Until you are thus sensible of your misery and lost condition, you are a servant to sin and to your lusts, under the bondage and command of Satan, doing his drudgery. You are under the curse of God and liable to his judgment. Consider how dreadful your state will be at death, and after the day of judgment, when you will be exposed to such miseries which the ear has not heard, neither can the heart conceive and that to all eternity, if you die, impenitent. But I hope better things of you, my brethren, though I thus speak, and things which accompany salvation. Go to God in prayer and be earnest with him, that by his Spirit he would convince you of your miserable condition by nature, and make you truly sensible of it. Well, be humbled, be humbled, I beseech you, for your sins. Having spent so many years in sinning, what can you do less than be concerned to spend some hours in mourning and sorrowing for the same, and be humble before God? Look back into your lives. Call to mind your sins, as many as possible you can, the sins of your youth, as well as of your riper years. See how you have departed from a gracious Father and wandered in the way of wickedness in which you have lost yourselves a favor of God the comforts of his spirit, and the peace of your own consciences. Then go and beg pardon of the Lord through the blood of the Lamb for the evil you have committed and for the good you have omitted. Consider likewise the heinousness of your sins. See what very aggravating circumstances your sins are attended with, how you have abused the patience of God, which should have led you to repentance. And when you find your heart hard, beg of God to soften it. Cry mightily to him, and he will take away your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. Resolve to leave all your sinful lusts and pleasures. 
renounce, forsake, and abhor your old sinful course of life, and serve God in holiness and righteousness all the remaining part of life. If you lament and bewail past sins, and do not forsake them, your repentance is in vain, you are mocking of God and deceiving your own soul. You must put off the old man with his deeds before you can put on the new man, Christ Jesus. You therefore who have been swearers and cursers, you who have been harlots and drunkards, you who have been thieves and robbers, you who have hitherto followed the sinful pleasures and diversions of life, let me beseech you by the mercies of God in Christ Jesus that you would no longer continue therein but that you would forsake your evil ways and turn to the Lord, for he waits to be gracious to you. He is ready. He is willing to pardon you of all your sins. But do not expect Christ to pardon you of sin when you run into it, and will not abstain from complying with the temptations. But if you will be persuaded to abstain from evil and choose the good, to return to the Lord and repent of your wickedness, he has promised he will abundantly pardon you. He will hear your backslidings and will love you freely. Resolve now this day to have done with your sins forever. Let your old ways and you be separated. You must resolve against it, for there can be no true repentance without a resolution to forsake it. Resolve for Christ. Resolve against the devil and his works. And go on fighting the Lord's battles against the devil and his emissaries. Attack him in the strongest holds he has, fight him as men, as Christians, and you will soon find him to be a coward. Resist him and he will fly from you. Resolve through grace to do this and your repentance is half done. But then take care that you do not ground your resolutions on your own strength, but in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. And he is the life. Without his assistance you can do nothing, but through his grace strengthening you, you will be enabled to do all things, and the more ready Christ will be to help you. And what can all the men of the world do to you when Christ is for you? You will not regard what they say against you, for you will have the testimony of a good conscience. Resolve to cast yourself at the feet of Christ in subjection to him, and throw yourself into the arms of Christ for salvation by him. Consider, my brethren, the many invitations he has given you to come to him to be saved by him. God has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Well, let me prevail with you above all things to make choice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Resign yourselves to him. Take him, oh, take him upon his own terms. And whoever you are, how great a sinner soever you have been, this evening, in the name of the great God, do I offer Jesus Christ to you. As you value your life and your soul, refuse him not, but stir up yourself to accept of the Lord Jesus. Take him holy as he is, for he will be applied holy to you, or else not at all. Jesus Christ must be your whole wisdom. He must be your whole righteousness. Jesus must be your whole sanctification, or he never will be your eternal redemption. What well, though you have been ever so wicked and profligate, yet if you will abandon your sins and turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, you shall have him given to you, and all your sins shall be freely forgiven. Oh, why will you neglect the great work of your repentance? Do not defer the doing of it one day longer, but today, even now, take that Christ who is freely offered to you. Now as to the causes of this, the first cause is God. He is the author. We are born of God. God has begotten us, even God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is he that stirs us up to will and to do of his own good pleasure. And another cause is God's free grace. It is owing to the riches of his free grace, my brethren, that we have been prevented from going down to hell long ago. It is because the compassions of the Lord fail not, they are new every morning and fresh every evening. Sometimes the instruments are very unlikely. A poor, despised minister or member of Jesus Christ may, by the power of God, be made an instrument in the hands of God of bringing you to true evangelical repentance. 
and this may be done to show that the power is not in men, but that it is entirely owing to the good pleasure of God. And if there has been any good done among many of you by preaching the word, as I trust there has, though it was preached in a field, if God has met and owned us and blessed his word, though preached by an enthusiastic babbler, a boy, a madman, I do rejoice and will rejoice, let foes say what they will. I shall now thirdly show the reasons why repentance is necessary to salvation. And this, my brethren, is plainly revealed to us in the word of God. The soul that does not repent and turn to the Lord shall die in its sins, and their blood shall be required at their own hands. It is necessary, as we have sinned, we should repent. For a holy God could not, nor ever can or will, admit anything that is unholy into his presence. This is a beginning of grace in the soul. There must be a change in heart and life before there can be a dwelling with a holy God. You cannot love sin and God too. You cannot love God and mammon. No unclean person can stand in the presence of God. It is contrary to the holiness of his nature. There is a contrariety between the holy nature of God and the unholy nature of carnal and unregenerate men. What communication can there be between a sinless God and creatures full of sin, between a pure God and impure creatures? If you were to be admitted into heaven with your present tempers and your impenitent condition, heaven itself would be a hell to you. The song of angels would be as enthusiasm and would be intolerable to you. Therefore you must have these tempers changed. You must be holy as God is holy. He must be your God here and you must be his people or you will never dwell together to all eternity. If you hate the ways of God and cannot spend an hour in his service, how will you think to be easy to all eternity and sing in praises to him that sits upon the throne and to the Lamb forever? And this is to be the employment, my brethren, of all those who are admitted into this glorious place, where neither sin nor sinner is admitted, where no scoffer ever can come without repentance from his evil ways, a turning to God and a cleaving to him, this must be done before any can be admitted into the glorious mansions of God, which are prepared for all that love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity and truth. Repent ye then of all your sins. Oh, my dear brethren, it makes my blood run cold in thinking that any of you should not be admitted into the glorious mansions above. Oh, that it was in my power I would place all of you, yea, you, my scoffing brethren, and the greatest enemy I have on earth at the right hand of Jesus, but this I cannot do. However, I advise and exhort you with all love and tenderness to make Jesus your refuge. Fly to him for relief. Jesus died to save such as you. He is full of compassion. And if you go to him as poor, lost, undone sinners, Jesus will give you his spirit. You shall live and reign and reign and live. You shall love and live and live and love with this Jesus to all eternity. I am fourthly to exhort all of you high and low, rich and poor, one with another, to repent of all your sins and turn to the Lord. And I shall speak to each of you, for you have either repented or you have not. You are believers in Christ Jesus or unbelievers. And first, you who never have truly repented of your sins and never have truly forsaken your lust, be not offended if I speak plain to you, for it is love, love to your souls that constrains me to speak. I shall lay before you your danger and the misery to which you are exposed while you remain impenitent in sin. And oh, that this may be a means of making you fly to Christ for pardon and forgiveness. While your sins are not repented of, you are in danger of death, and if you should die, you would perish forever. There is no hope of any who live and die in their sins, but that they will dwell with devils and damned spirits to all eternity. And how do we know we shall live much longer? We are not sure of seeing our own habitations this night in safety. What mean you, then, being at ease and pleasure while your sins are not pardoned? As sure as ever the word of God is true, if you die in that condition, you are shut out of all hope and mercy forever and shall pass into the ceaseless and endless misery. What is all your pleasures and diversions worth? They last but for a moment. They are of no worth and but of a short continuance. 
And sure it must be gross folly eagerly to pursue those sinful lusts and pleasures which war against a soul which tend to harden the heart and keep us from closing with the Lord Jesus. Indeed, these are destructive of our peace here and without repentance will be of our peace hereafter. Oh, the folly and madness of the sensual world. Sure, if there were nothing in sin but present slavery, it would keep an ingenuous spirit from it. But to do the devil's drudgery, and if we do that, we shall have his wages, which is eternal death and condemnation. Oh, consider this, my guilty brethren, you that think it no crime to swear, whore, drink, or scoff, and cheer it to people of God. Consider how your voices will then be changed, and you that counted their lives madness, and their end without honor shall howl and lament at your own madness and folly, that should bring you to so much woe and distress. Then you will lament and bemoan your own dreadful condition, but it will be of no signification, for he that is not your merciful Savior will then become your inexorable judge. Now he is easy to be entreated, but then all your tears and prayers will be in vain. For God has allotted to every man a day of grace, a time of repentance, which if he does not improve, but neglects and despises the means which are offered to him, he cannot be saved. Consider, therefore, while you are going on in a course of sin and unrighteousness, I beseech you, my brethren, to think of the consequences that will attend your thus misspending your precious time. Your souls are worth being concerned about, for if you can enjoy all the pleasures and diversions of life, at death you must leave them. That will put an end to all your worldly concerns. And will it not be very deplorable to have your good things here? all your earthly, sensual, devilish pleasures, which you have been so much taken up with all over, and the thought of how for trifling a concern you have lost eternal welfare, it will gnaw your very soul. Your wealth and grandeur will stand in no stead. You can carry nothing of it into the other world than the consideration of your uncharitableness to the poor, and the ways you did take to obtain your wealth will be a very hell to you. Now you enjoy the means of grace as the preaching of his word, prayer, and sacraments. And God has sent his ministers out into the fields and highways to invite, to woo you to come in. But they are tiresome to you. You would rather be at your pleasures ere long, my brethren, they will be over, and you will be no more troubled with them. But then you would give ten thousand worlds for one moment of that merciful time of grace which you have abused. Then you will cry for a drop of that precious blood which now you trample under your feet. Then you will wish for one more offer of mercy for Christ and his free grace to be offered to you again. But your crying will be in vain. For as you would not repent here, God will not give you an opportunity to repent hereafter. If you would not in Christ's time, you shall not in your own. And what a dreadful condition will you then be? What horror and astonishment will possess your souls? Then all the lies and oaths, your scoffs and jeers at the people of God, all your filthy and unclean thoughts and actions, your misspent time in balls, plays, and assemblies, your spending whole evenings at cards, dice, and masquerades, your frequenting of taverns and alehouses, your worldliness, covetousness, and your uncharitableness will be brought at once to your remembrance and at once charged upon your guilty soul. And how can you bear the thoughts of these things? Indeed, I am full of compassion towards you, to think that this should be the portion of any who now hear me. These are truths, though awful ones, my brethren. These are the truths of the gospel, and if there was not a necessity for thus speaking, I would willingly forbear, for it is no pleasing subject to me any more than it is to you. But it is my duty to show you the dreadful consequences of continuing in sin. I am only now acting the part of a skillful surgeon that searches a wound before he heals it. I would show you your danger first, that deliverance may be the more readily accepted of by you. Consider that however you may be for putting the evil day away from you, and are now striving to hide your sins, at the day of judgment there shall be a full discovery of all. Hidden things on that day shall be brought to light. And after all your sins have been revealed to the whole world, then you must depart into everlasting fire and hell, 
which will not be quenched night and day. It will be without intermission, without end. Oh, then, what stupidity and senselessness has possessed your hearts, that you are not frighted from your sins. The fear of Nebuchadnezzar's fiery furnace made men do anything to avoid it, and shall not an everlasting fire make men make you do anything to avoid it? Oh, that this would awaken and cause you to humble yourselves for your sins, and obey pardon for them, that you might find mercy in the Lord. Do not go away. Let not the devil hurry you away before the sermon is over. But stay, and you shall have a Jesus offered to you, who has made full satisfaction for all your sins. Let me beseech you to cast away your transgressions, to strive against sin to watch against it and to beg power and strength from Christ to keep down the power of those lusts that hurry you on in your sinful ways. But if you will not do any of these things, if you are resolved to sin on, you must expect eternal death to be the consequence. You must expect to be seized with horror and trembling, with horror and amazement to hear the dreadful sentence of condemnation pronounced against you and then you will run and call upon the mountains to fall on you to hide you from the lord and from the fierce anger of his wrath had you now a heart to turn from your sins to the living god by true and unfeigned repentance and to pray to him for mercy in and through the merits of jesus christ there were hope But at the day of judgment, your prayers and tears will be of no signification. They will be of no service to you. The judge will not be entreated by you, as he would not hearken to him when he called to you, but despise both him and his ministers, and would not leave your iniquities. Therefore on that day he will not be entreated, notwithstanding all your cries and tears. For God himself has said, Because I have called and you have refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but you have said it not all my counsel, and with none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity and mock when your fear comes as desolation, and your destruction comes as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish comes upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. Now you may call this enthusiasm and madness, but at that great day, if you repent not of your sins, here you will find by woeful experience that your own ways were madness indeed. But God forbid it should be left undone till then. Seek after the Lord while he is to be found. Call upon him while he is near, and you shall find mercy. Repent this hour, and Christ will joyfully receive you. What say you? Must I go to my master and tell him you will not come to him? And you will have none of his counsels? No, do not send me on so unhappy an errand. I cannot, I will not tell him any such thing. Shall not I rather tell him you are willing to repent and to be converted, to become new men, and take up a new course of life? This is the only wise resolution you can make. Let me tell my master that you will come unto and will wait upon him. For if you do not, it will be your ruin in time and to eternity. You will at death wish you had lived the life of the righteous, that you might have died his death. Be advising, consider what is before you, Christ in the world, holiness and sin, life and death. Choose now for yourselves. Let your choice be made immediately, and let that choice be your dying choice. If you would not choose to die in your sins, to die drunkards, to die adulterers, to die swearers and scoffers, and so on, live not out this night in the dreadful condition you are in. Some of you, it may be, may say, you have not power, you have not strength, but have you not been wanting to yourselves in such things that were within your power? Have you not as much power to go to hear a sermon as to go into a playhouse or to a ball or masquerade? You have as much power to read the Bible as to read plays, novels, and romances, and you can associate as well with the godly as with the wicked and profane. This is but an idle excuse, my brethren, to go on in your sins. And if you would be found in the means of grace, Christ has promised he will give you strength. While Peter was preaching, the Holy Ghost fell on all that heard the word. How then should you be found in the way of your duty? Jesus Christ will then give you strength. He will put his spirit upon you. You shall find he will be your wisdom, your righteousness, your sanctification, and your redemption. 
Do but try what a gracious and a kind and loving master he is. He will be a help to you in all your burdens. And if the burden of sin is on your soul, go to him as weary and heavy laden, and you shall find rest. Do not say that your sins are too many and too great to expect to find mercy. No, be they ever so many or ever so great, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ will cleanse you from all sin. God's grace, my brethren, is free, rich, and sovereign. Manasseh was a great sinner, and yet he was pardoned. Zacchaeus was gone far from God and went out to see Christ with no other view but to satisfy his curiosity. And yet Jesus met him and brought salvation to his house. Manasseh was an idolater and murderer, yet he received mercy. The other was an oppressor and extortioner who had gotten riches by fraud and deceit and by grinding the faces of the poor. So did Matthew too, and yet they found mercy. Have you been blasphemers and persecutors of the saints and servants of God? Well, so was Paul, yet he received mercy. Have you been common harlots, filthy and unclean persons? So was Mary Magdalene, and yet she received mercy. Have you been a thief? The thief upon the cross found mercy. I despair of none of you, however vile and profligate you have been. I say, I despair of none of you, especially when God has had mercy on such a wretch as I am. Remember the poor publican, how he found favor with God. When the proud, self-conceited Pharisee who puffed up with his own righteousness was rejected. And if you will go to Jesus as a poor publican did under a sense of your own unworthiness, you shall find favor as he did. There is virtue enough in the blood of Jesus to pardon greater sinners, and he is yet pardoned. Then be not discouraged, but come to Jesus, and you will find him ready to help in all your distress, to lead you into all truth, to bring you from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan to God. Do not let the devil deceive you by telling you that then all your delights and pleasures will be over. No, this is so far from depriving you of all pleasure that it is an inlet to unspeakable delights, peculiar to all who are truly regenerated. The new birth is the very beginning of a life of peace and comfort, and the greatest pleasantness is to be found in the ways of holiness. Solomon, who had experience of all other pleasures, yet saith of the ways of godliness, that all her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are paths of peace then sure you will not let the devil deceive you. It is all he wants. It is that he aims at to make religion appear to be melancholy, miserable, and enthusiastic. But let him say what he will. Give not ear to him. Don't regard him, for he always was and will be a liar. What words, what entreaties shall I use to make you calm unto the Lord Jesus Christ? The little love I have experienced since I have been brought from sin to God is so great that I would not be in a natural state for ten thousand worlds. And what I have felt is but little to what I hope to feel. But that little love which I have experienced is a sufficient buoy against all the storms and tempests of this boisterous world. And let men and devils do their worst, I rejoice in the Lord Jesus, yea, and I will rejoice. And oh, if you repent and come to Jesus, I would rejoice on your accounts too. And we should rejoice together to all eternity when once passed on the other side of the grave. O come to Jesus. The arms of Jesus Christ will embrace you. He will wash away all your sins in his blood and will love you freely. Come, I beseech you, to come to Jesus Christ. O that my words would pierce to the very soul. O that Jesus Christ was formed in you. O that you would turn to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he might have mercy upon you. I would speak till midnight, yea, I would speak till I could speak no more, so it might be a means to bring you to Jesus. Let the Lord Jesus but enter your souls, and you shall find peace which the world can neither give nor take away. There is mercy for the greatest sinner amongst you. Go to the Lord as sinners, helpless and undone without it, and then you shall find comfort in your souls, and be admitted at last amongst those who sing praises to the Lord to all eternity. Come, all of you, come and behold him stretched out for you. See his hands and his feet nailed to the cross. Oh, come, come, my brethren, and nail your sins there too. Come, come, and see his side pierced. There is a fountain open for sin and for uncleanness. 
Oh, wash, wash, and be clean. Come and see his head crowned with thorns, and all for you. Can you think of a panting, bleeding, dying Jesus, and not be filled with pity towards him? He underwent all this for you. Come unto him by faith. Lay hold on him. There is mercy for every soul of you that will come unto him. Then do not delay. Fly to the arms of this Jesus, and you shall be made clean in his blood. But what shall I say to you to make you come to Jesus? I have showed you the dreadful consequence of not repenting of your sins. And if after all I have said you are resolved to persist, your blood will be required at your own hands. But I hope better things of you and things that accompany salvation. Let me beg of you to pray in good earnest for the grace of repentance. I may never see your faces again, but at the day of judgment I will meet you. There you will either bless God that ever you were moved to repentance, or else this sermon, though in a field, will be a swift witness against you. Repent, repent, therefore, my dear brethren, as John the Baptist and as our blessed Redeemer himself earnestly exhorted, and turn from your evil ways, and the Lord will have mercy on you. Show them, O Father, in which they have offended you. Make them to see their own vileness, and that they are lost and undone without true repentance. And, O, oh, give them that repentance, we beseech of you, that they may turn from sin to you, the living and true God. These things and whatever else you see needful for us, we entreat that you would bestow upon us on account of what the dear Jesus Christ has done and suffered, to whom with yourself and Holy Spirit, three persons and one God be ascribed as his most due all power, glory, might, Majesty and dominion now henceforth and forever. Amen.